I guess a vaccine is coming. That's what we're hearing. Show of hands. Go ahead and participate. When the vaccine gets here, raise your hand. You will definitely get it. Yes, you're a definite yes. Raise your hand. Wow. All right. Okay, thank you. You are a definite no. You will not get it. Raise your hand. Okay. Well, there's only one category left, right? You are an undecided. Raise your hand. <laughs> Come on, undecided. Who's with me? All right. Okay, it's spattering. It involves a lot of trust, doesn't it? Any vaccine does. A lot of trust. Trust in your government. Trust in the process. Trust in the scientist. Trust in the biology and the chemistry. Even trust in the person sticking it in your arm. It involves a lot of trust to get a shot of any kind. Tremendous spiritual parallels there. You can, uh, you can chew on that all afternoon. But as we consider the vaccine and we consider the choice that will be before us of definite yes, definite no, or, or undecided, we could debate the consequences of rejecting that vaccine, or any vaccine for that matter. We could consider the results of that rejection. Some people think it would be grave, and others think it will be minimal to, to zero, but there would be some possibility of consequences of rejecting this uh, COVID-19 vaccine that is surely, surely coming. The flu shot, I'm out. I've been out for years. And in my mind, and you could argue with me, you probably will later, in my mind, the consequences of rejecting a flu shot are, are minimal to zero, at least for me. That's my personal decision there, right? Minimal consequences, especially when you consider that uh, we are told flu shots have an effective rate of somewhere as low as 20% and as high as maybe 60%. We are bombarded with decisions in life. How many decisions does a human being make in their lifetime? We are bombarded with even monumental decisions throughout life, like vaccines and marriage and jobs. And are we going to buy this house or that house? Are we going to live in this place or that place? And, and there are lots of big and small decisions. But there is one decision, there is one decision that we make in our lifetime that has the ultimate in consequences, that has the ultimate in results. A yes or a no with this decision carries both weighty consequences in this life, which we often minimize, and of course, eternal, never-ending consequences. The title of the sermon this morning is this, the results of rejecting Jesus. The results of rejecting Jesus. And our text is Matthew 12, 22 to 32. Now, if you were with us last week, the tone was warm and hopeful. It was fulfillment of ancient prophecies by Christ, and, and we tried to match that tone. Well, this week, the tone goes in the entirely different end of the spectrum. The tone this week is a tone of warning. It's a sober tone, serious words here for us in this passage, Matthew 12, 22 to 32. We will start this morning with the setting. If you've got a red letter Bible, most of it's in red. There's a setting, there's an event, there's a, there's a happening, and then the, the majority of this text is the response of Jesus to this event. So we will begin this morning with the setting, verses 22 and 23. So look at it there with me. It says, then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus. Let's just pause right there for a moment and just close your eyes just for a moment with me. Be blind for a moment. And now I'm going to ask you some questions about yourself, but oh, wait, you can't talk. You cannot form words with your mouth. And if that wasn't bad enough, you are in this scenario here possessed of a filthy, corrupt, irredeemable, unredeemable enemy of God, and you can do nothing about it. You can open your eyes. A demon-possessed man was blind and mute, and he was brought to Jesus, and he healed him. He healed him. 
so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this cannot be the son of David, can he? This is our setting this morning. This poor, wretched, miserable man had, had three obvious problems here. The main problem was he was demon-possessed, and this demon possession obviously and apparently caused these other two problems of blindness and muteness. He, he could not form words. He could not speak. We're not told here, but often if a person is mute, they're also deaf. And on top of all of that, we know him to be a sinner, of course, a child of Adam who is lost in his sins. And he is a miserable creature. He is, his life is... Um, is really a very bad one in many, many ways. And they bring this person to Jesus and Jesus mercifully and powerfully and instantly and permanently and undeniably heals him. And Matthew's very understated here in the, in the healing miracle. Matthew's understated as to what happens. The mute man spoke and saw. The really interesting part is verse 23 with the crowds. The crowds are astonished this word amazed, this is the only time this word is used in the Gospel of Matthew, which is pretty amazing, because a lot of amazing things have happened in Matthew, but he's never used this word. This word is the emoji of the blown mind. <laughs> People there that day started texting their friends like 10 blown mind emojis, right, because this is how they felt. They were beside themselves with astonishment. By the way, this is the only blind and mute person healed in the Gospels. This is a landmark miracle of Jesus, even though Matthew understates it so. And the crowds now have this amazing, astonished reaction, and they ask a rhetorical question that in the grammar actually expects no for an answer. Their question is, this man cannot be the son of David can he? One commentator called it, um, uh, how did he describe it? It was kind of a doubtful wondering. It says, oh, no, 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 there's no way he's the Messiah. No, it's not possible. But is it? C could he be? He just healed a man who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. So there might even be this tiny, even though they expect an, a negative answer, this tiny seed of faith there beginning to to take place. This is the setting for our passage this morning, but I want to just pause here and say to you, do you see here what I see, which is a picture of salvation in this miracle, as many of the miracles of Jesus often are? See, Jesus came offering personal salvation and national salvation. And here is an illustration of really both taking place. Here is a picture of our spiritual salvation. For like this man, before Christ, we were hopeless, we were helpless, and we were held hostage by the strong man. This man could do nothing about his condition. He could not change his blindness. He could not cause words to come out of his mouth. His heart was dead. He could not praise God just as we didn't and couldn't before our conversion, and he's held hostage by someone stronger, more powerful than he is, just as we were before our conversion. The Bible says in 2 Timothy that the lost are held captive by the devil to do his will. And so what a picture here of salvation. And in our context of Matthew, here is the weary and the heavy laden. Jesus had said at the end of Matthew 11, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Where did they bring him? They brought him to Jesus. He physically couldn't come on his own, on his own but they brought him to Jesus. And now this weary and heavy laden has been given rest. Rest from this demon. Rest from his blindness. Rest from his muteness. This man here is none other than the broken reed. This is the smoldering wick. And they bring him to Jesus, and Jesus does not ignore him. Jesus does not crush him. Jesus does not rebuke him. Jesus heals him out of mercy and out of kindness. This is an amazing, incredible miracle. And even though the crowds 
are doubtful that he is the Messiah, apparently their question is unnerving to the Pharisees who hear it. And so the Pharisees now will play their trump card. They will put all of their cards now on the table, verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. The question has made the Pharisees incredibly uncomfortable. They must fight back with the strongest offense they can muster. You remember, they have already been plotting the murder of Jesus in secret. Now, this is their moment of public rejection. This verse, verse 24, is a watershed moment in the Gospel of Matthew. There is no turning back for these Pharisees. They are now crossing a line. They have now stepped out into the abyss of a final and full rejection of Christ. They claim here, they charge him here, in this public, open, visible rejection, they are charging Jesus with sorcery. You say, well, how do you see that? Or why does that even matter? Because sorcery under the old covenant was penalized with what? Death. You starting to see a trend here? They want him dead. First it was the Sabbath violation, and now it is a charge of sorcery. They are basically saying that he did this miracle by black magic, by the power of Satan himself, Beelzebul, uh, another word for Satan. And isn't it interesting? They will say the name Beelzebul, but they will not say the name Jesus. They never say the name Jesus. They hate it. The Pharisees hate the name of Yeshua, Joshua, Yahweh saves they will never, in the recorded record, utter those words. They will not come from their lips. But they're very comfortable saying Beelzebul. The Pharisees here have two massive problems. Massive problems. Number one, there is no denying that the miracle happened. Did you see that? <laughs> they don't deny the miracle because they can't. It was obvious. It was true. It was real. It was permanent. That's their first problem. Their second problem is Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 is a prophecy of the Messiah speaking of the kingdom conditions when he would come. And it says this, quote, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. That's their problem, right? You've got an undeniable miracle that implicates or implies that Jesus is the Messiah. That brings us to our text idea this morning. When the Pharisees, I put it on the screen for you because it's a, it's a bit lengthy, but here now is the text idea for this entire passage. When the Pharisees completed their rejection of Jesus with an accusation that he cast out demons by the power of Satan, Jesus warned them about the results of their rejection. Our sermon idea then is Jesus warns us about the results of rejecting him. The sermon purpose this morning is to warn you about the inevitable results of rejecting Jesus Christ as your king. See, we could go verse by verse into a running commentary of this passage, and it would be a wonderful history lesson, and you would learn a lot of Bible today, and I would be nothing but a teacher, but that's not a sermon. A sermon is preaching, and preaching brings the ancient text into our present day and moment. And so how do we take this passage and take its principles that are timeless and relevant for every age and bring it into Kerrville, Texas, the year 2020? It is this sermon idea and this sermon purpose. Today is a sermon of warning. What will happen in this life and the next if you reject Jesus Christ as your king? If you spurn him, if you ignore him, if you decide you don't need him, if he is not your Lord, your master, your, your rabbi, your teacher, your savior, what will be the inevitable results? What will be the consequences of such a decision? We will see four this morning. Four results of rejecting Jesus. There are certainly more than these four, but that's what this passage will show us. So let us begin with number one, 
you will embrace the absurd. If you reject Jesus, you will, you must, you will be forced to embrace the absurd. Let's say and look at verse 24 again because this is where the absurdity begins. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Verse 25, and knowing their thoughts, apparently they didn't say that where Jesus could hear it. Apparently it wasn't out loud. It was just among themselves. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, is depopulated, literally. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they, your sons, will be your judges. You will embrace the absurd. If you reject Jesus in this life, you will, by definition, believe the silly, the strange, and the ridiculous. You will fall for the illogical, the irrational, and the bizarre. Your worldview, the way you see the world, the way you put things together, the way you interpret human behavior will be incongruous and ludicrous. It will be filled with inconsistencies if you reject Jesus. Let me give you a couple examples of what liberal theologians do, an example of embracing the absurd. Liberal theologians do not believe in a bodily resurrection of Christ. They don't believe that his resurrection was physical, bodily, literal. So they have to embrace the ludicrous. They say the resurrection of Christ was only spiritual. It was only spiritual in nature. It was he, his spirit, his body never changed. It died, it stayed in the tomb, but his spirit went up, went up to heaven. And, and, we, and we have the resurrection accounts in the gospel because, you know, these early Christians needed hope. Their life was hard, it was oppressive, and it was difficult. And they believed in this Jesus as the Messiah. And so they needed some hope that they too, when they die, maybe their spirits would go to a better place. And so they recast the entire resurrection event and story as a spiritual, not a physical resurrection. Liberal theologians do this. We have many in our own town who would believe this way. Here's another example of how li liberal theologians have to embrace the absurd to interpret the miracles of Jesus. The feeding of the 5,000, they say, well, here's what really happened. See, the early church made up that story to just you know, encourage faith in Jesus. But here's what really happened. They were all there that day, and the young boy, he pulls out his, his pack lunch that his mom made for him, and, and he looks around and sees all these hungry people, and the lad begins to share his lunch. How sweet, how nice, what a wonderful boy he is. What a good little boy he is. He shared his lunch, and then all the adults noticed, and they said, wow, we ought to share our lunch too. And so everybody brought out their pack lunch and shared it with one another, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. The ridiculous, the silly, the strange, the ludicrous. Verse 27 is, is quite interesting. Verse 25 and 26 are, are, are basically Jesus appealing to common sense, right? Uh, Jesus appealing to just reason. Your, your explanation, Pharisees, makes no sense at all. Satan casting out Satan, Satan defeating himself, fighting against himself, then his kingdom wouldn't stand. That is... That is foolish. You're, you're, you're looking really stupid right now, Pharisees. I mean, that's basically what Jesus is saying with this illustration. He's basically saying, you, you look stupid because you are stupid. Okay? <laughs> Think about it. And then verse 27 brings in another wrinkle. Needs a little more explanation. If I, by the power of Satan or Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? He doesn't probably mean literal sons here, biological sons. He means sons in the way the Bible often means it. Followers. Your associates. Those who are coming behind you. Those who are emulating you. And, and those of whom you Pharisees confirm and, and you approve of. So here's the situation. You've got some Jewish exorcists who are apparently casting out demons by the power of God. 
And the Pharisees consider them their associates, and so the Pharisees are approving of their exorcisms. That's who Jesus is referring to here in verse 27. And so he says, then if I'm doing this by Satan, how are they doing it? And then he turns it on them, and he, because what they've said is really self-incriminating. He says, for this reason, they, your sons, will be your judges. They will condemn you. Well, how so? How do they condemn the Pharisees? Well, in two ways. Stay with me, all right? Number one, if they cast out a demon and someone says, how did you cast out the demon? And if they say, we cast, it in, we cast him out by the power of Satan, then they condemn the Pharisees because the Pharisees approve of them. You with me? So the Pharisees got a big problem there, right? If they are casting out demons by the power of Satan, then the Pharisees are approving Satan. Okay, second option, if you cast out a demon, how did you do that? Well, it was the power of God. Well, that judges the Pharisees as well because they will not allow Jesus the same possibility. Here's Jesus, a Jewish man, casting out demons, and he says he does it by the power of God. Why will you not give him the same option as your own sons? So in either case, they are judged, they are condemned, they are undermined as Jesus uses logic and common sense against them, forcing them to admit they are embracing the absurd and the ludicrous. Let me give you some modern examples of this. The list would be endless, but here are several that uh, I think illustrate this for us. What happens if you reject Jesus, you will embrace the absurd? Well, the 60s was a decade of rejecting Jesus, was it not? So many of America's problems today started in the 60s. So many of the movements that continue on today and the, uh, the difficulties of our nation today found their birth there. It was a decade of rejecting Jesus. And out of the 60s came this movement that was actually plastered on Time magazine during the 1960s, probably close to the middle of that decade, and it was the God is Dead movement. You basically had theologians and general society asking the question or even suggesting the possibility or even making the assertion boldly, God is dead. This came about in the 60s. And I asked, could there be anything more absurd than that statement? You have a dependent creature, dependent on God for everything, saying that God is dead. You're alive but God is dead, right? This is as ridiculous as it gets. If you reject creation through the Lord Jesus Christ as God's agent, you will be forced to embrace this outlandish theory called the Big Bang Theory. That out of nothing, there was this massive explosion that created what we see today, everything. Everything. Well, what caused the explosion? Well, how was there an explosion? Or what actually exploded? <laughs> and of course, that leads to the myth of evolution. You see, you reject creation, and what are you left with? Big bang and evolution. That we came out of a primordial slime. That we, we have ascended from monkeys and lower forms of life. Here's another. If you reject God's right to assign your gender and to define marriage, what are you left with? You are left with the unending absurdities of the LGBTQ plus movement and agenda. You're left with all of those ridiculous assertions and absurdities if you reject that God alone has the right to give me my gender and God alone has the right to define marriage. If you reject the biblical origins of man of mankind as coming from one man and one woman, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, then you will try to fight racism with racism, a la the BLM movement. If you reject the Scriptures teaching that man's bent is toward violence and evil and that God created government to restrain evil and to punish evildoers, if you reject all of that, then you will call for safer cities by the defunding of police. 
So you're left with nothing but the ludicrous and the absurd when you begin to move away from the truth of the Bible. And if you reject God as the author of human life from conception, then you will end up embracing legalized murder of babies. Defenseless, helpless babies in the womb and calling it legal, calling it choice. And an entire political party making it a platform, a conviction upon which they stand and seek voters. So if you want to be an absurd fool this morning, reject Jesus. Reject the Bible and live your entire life that way. And you will be doing nothing but embracing the absurd. Number two, the second result of rejecting Jesus is you will miss the obvious. You will miss the obvious. Verses 28 and 29. Jesus now goes on the offensive after playing some defense. He says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, and he does, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has been offered in your midst. The kingdom of God has arrived. Illustration, verse 29, or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Unless he first ties up the strong man and then he will plunder his house. I call this second result missing the obvious. The kingdom here is said to have come upon or among them, and this is very important, listen to this, this is the last time Matthew will use that kind of language about the kingdom of God. Why is it the last time? Because what the Pharisees have done is irrevocable. They've stepped over the line. They've made their rejection public. So what's going on here in this illustration, this statement? You've got the Messiah he is literally standing right there, right? He is offering personal salvation and he's offering an earthly messianic kingdom to the nation of Israel. And he has showed them in this miracle, he has showed them that he is ready and willing and able to tie up the strong man. He is ready to bind Satan. He is ready to bring in the kingdom. If Israel will repent and believe and accept him, the offer is real. It's right there, and he's demonstrated it by this miracle. You see, binding Satan is a kingdom condition. Binding Satan is a condition of the Messianic millennial kingdom. That's why in Revelation 20, at the second coming of Christ, 21 to 4, we're told that Satan is bound, cast into a pit for a thousand years. This is a condition for the kingdom. And so Jesus is saying, what I've just done is a miniature picture of binding Satan. I'm offering this to you, national salvation, corporate salvation. This is a softball toss using a beach ball and the batter has a tennis racket. And the esteemed, hallowed, admired religious leaders of Israel completely whiff. They completely miss the obvious. How many prophecies did he fulfill? How many miracles did he perform? And they see them and they hear them and their only recourse is to embrace the absurd and then miss the obvious. There is one here stronger than the strong man. There is one here who can bind Satan and remove him from the human condition. There is one here empowered by the Spirit of God like no man has ever been empowered by the Spirit of God. There is one here who is the king himself offering the kingdom. And they completely miss it because they are blind and hard of heart. Those who reject Jesus then will build on the unstable properties of sand and they will not even realize it. I mean, anybody else that's walking by goes, wow, dude, you're building on sand. It's quite obvious. And you're like, no, I'm not. This is a solid foundation. What are you talking about? Right? 
Those who reject Jesus will possess, they will build and possess a, a, a quilt, really. It's a patchwork worldview. It's just, it's eclectic. It's ecumenical. It's just like the middle of this, a little of that. Just kind of, get me, I'm building a quilt here. That's my worldview. It's just a little bit of everything. Whatever I consider is right in my own eyes. That's my filter, my judgment, my wisdom is how I build my quilt to my worldview. And this worldview is full of contradictions, and they don't even see them. They don't even see them. And someone comes along in an apologetic ministry, begins to point out the contradictions of their own worldview, and at first there's a lot of defense, a lot of resistance. They will miss the obvious. If you reject Jesus, you will miss the obvious that man is sinful, not good, that man is devolving, not evolving, that the world is getting worse, not better. It's quite obvious to those whose eyes are open. But if you miss Jesus, you miss the obvious. The question I have for you this morning, I ask you, I ask you this morning, are you missing the obvious about yourself? Are you missing the obvious that you need to be born again? Are you missing the obvious that you need to repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior? Are you missing the obvious that you're only playing church? You haven't joined Jesus? Are you missing the obvious that the King has offered salvation to you, but you only want to escape hell and not bow before this King? See, there's an obvious that we can miss as well. It's right here in front of us. If you want to miss the obvious for your entire life, then reject Jesus to your last breath. Third result. Third result of rejecting Jesus. This is very fascinating. Verse 30, you will search in vain for a neutral position. You will search in vain for a neutral position. Look at verse 30. He who is not with me is what? against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. This is shepherding terminology. He who is not with me, he doesn't say is neutral, is undecided, is, has chosen some middle ground position. He says, if you are not positively, positively with me, then you are, by definition, against me. And if you are not gathering sheep with me, you are scattering sheep. You are, <laughs> you're tending to goats with the devil if you are not gathering sheep with the chief shepherd. See, Jesus eliminates the neutral position. And so if you reject him, you will search in vain for neutral Who is verse 34? Who is he talking to? I mean, he's not talking to the Pharisees. They've already made up their mind. They've already decided. The Pharisees are plotting to murder him, and he knows it. The Pharisees have said, you are possessed of the devil. He's not talking to the Pharisees here. Who's he talking to? There's two possibilities. First possibility is he's talking to the sons of the Pharisees back in verse 27. He's talking to these Jewish exorcists, follow this now, who are serving God in their minds. These Jewish exorcists who are casting out demons by the power of God, apparently. He's addressing them with this verse. He's showing them that, oh, you may think that you're serving God, you may think that you're doing good, but as long as you're not with me, you are against me. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how many signs you have. I don't care how much power you have. I don't care how much you, good you do for humanity. If you're not with me, with Jesus Christ, you're against me. If you're not gathering, if you're not evangelizing, if you're not making disciples, then you're scattering, he's saying. That's one possibility, and it's a good one. Here's another possibility. Jesus is addressing the crowd. So we ought to remember, every time Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, there's a crowd around, right? There's, there's his 12, and then there's these people, hundreds of them sometimes. And they're kind of on the fringe. They're the curious. They're the onlookers, right? And who, I mean, everybody likes to see a good fight, right? So here's Jesus and the Pharisees going at it yet again, gathers a crowd, want to see this tussle, right? And so 
He may be addressing them. He's throwing these words out there for these listening bystanders. Hey, hey, you, hey, you, John Doe over there on the back row. If you're not with me, you're against me. Hey, Sally over here, paying attention to butterflies. Listen to me. If you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. You got somebody in the crowd who's watched this miracle take place. And they've watched this statement of the Pharisees and they've heard all of these words and here's what's going on. They're standing there thinking to themselves, okay, I'm not willing to say he's of the devil. That's too far. I mean, devil wouldn't do so much good for this poor man. But on the other hand, I'm not willing to say that this is all of God either, right? I, I don't like the implications of that. That's a bit challenging to my autonomy. <laughs> They're thinking to themselves. Okay, I know I just saw the miracle. I know it just happened. Let's be reasonable here. Let's be reasonable. Let's not get carried away. Let's not become some fanatic. Let's not jump in too fast. Don't, don't get carried away with yourselves. Let's be reasonable. Let's be wise. Yes, you're a prudent person. You're cautious. Let's check undecided. <laughs> I feel so good about myself. I'm not rash. I'm very rational and intelligent. It's not the devil. I don't know that it's God either. I'm, I'm undecided. And Jesus crawls right into their thinking and says, I take your undecided category away from you. If you are not with me, you're against me. Jesus says that is not an option. You see, you're searching in vain for a neutral position that does not exist, for an undecided, for a, for a place of of postpone decision and Jesus says it doesn't exist you can be undecided about a vaccine I may be for a long time which is a decision right <laughs> but you cannot be undecided about the Lord Jesus Christ this is like voting I love voting voting is not about your opinion anymore voting is not a poll anymore it's not what you might do anymore you get into that booth you get in that place you, undecided is no longer an option right if you don't vote, then it didn't, it didn't even exist that you went there, right? You have to make a choice. Check a box. Make a decision. Jesus takes away undecided. Are you hiding this morning from God in the philosophical wo woods of agnosticism? Agnosticism says we can't know. I'm not an atheist. That's a decision. I'm not a believer. That's a decision. We just can't know. We don't have all the facts yet. I'm just going to stay, I want to keep all my options open. I'm an agnostic. Are you like the ref who blows the whistle and then just stands there? And all the players stop and they're like, make a call. He doesn't, he just stands there. He goes, oh, I've got to go to the monitor. So he goes over to the monitor. And then he watches the play for like five minutes, you know. And the whole world is watching him. It was clear the ball went off the guy's knee. I mean, make a call, right? There are a lot of people like that in the world. No, I'm still at the monitor. I got to see it again. I got to hear it again and again. I got to watch it over and over and over. What else do you need? The evidence is so clear. Make a decision. If you're either for him or you're against him, there's no fence, there's no middle ground. You can't stand at the monitor for eternity. Jesus says, I take that option away from you. I am the King of kings. I am the Lord of lords. Your option is either surrender or rebel against me. Those are the options. You see, the truth is, if you are not actively praying and actively working for Jesus, then you are working for the devil. Those are the only two options. You're an evangelist for Jesus or an unwitting evangelist for the devil. The neutral person sees Jesus as a prophet. Jesus as a good teacher. Jesus as a moral example. The neutral person sees Jesus as Plato. I will mold him into whatever I want him to be. Whatever suits my fancy. Whatever I need in the moment. If I need self-esteem, I'll make a self-esteem Jesus. If I need to be a cult leader, I'll make a, a, a Jesus that I can mold into my new doctrine. 
Whatever you want him to be. That's what the neutral person does with the real Jesus. I'm here to announce this morning, the king of kings blows up neutral. If I don't accomplish anything this morning, I want to accomplish that you have no middle ground to stand on. You either all in with Jesus Christ or you will rebel and you are rebelling against him. Listen to me, what appears to your deceived heart as humility is actually high-handed rebellion. See, the agnostic wants to say he's humble, he's actually a coward, and it's actually nothing but rebellion against the truth. It is time to repent of reverse, reject neutral as an option, and put it in drive. Forward. Forward to God. Forward to heaven. Forward to the cause of Christ. But if you want to waste your entire life looking for neutral, then reject Jesus. And you will do so. Now looking at one to three, you notice that these are all in this life. These are all of the earthly results, temporal results, and they're bad. And, and you'll have wasted your life. You will look the fool. You'll miss the obvious offer of salvation. And your whole life will be nothing but a search in vain for one thing after another. But this last one, number four, is in the next life. And so it is worst of all. It is the worst result of all. Fourth and finally, if you reject Jesus, you will doom yourself to an eternity of unforgiveness. Verses 31 and 32. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. In other words, it will never be forgiven, ever, ever. There will be no second chance, no offer of mercy, no do-over. If you commit this sin, you doom yourself to an eternity of unforgiveness. This, of course, is the classic text on the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It would be easy for us to jump right there and get all tangled up in what does this mean? And it's been debated for centuries, all the way back to the early church. Right. But, but often, if we do that, we're going to miss something that's here. And, and I hadn't seen it till this week. Let us not miss the good news. <clears throat> Let us not miss the promise of the gospel here in this verse. Look at it. Look at it. Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. Wow! This is the gospel. This is the good news. Any sin, any rebellion against God, any refusal of Jesus Christ in this life, any sin, any immorality, any greed, any lust, any stealing, any murder, any adultery, any thought, any word, any behavior that God calls sin, any sin shall be forgiven people. And blasphemy, this is a, a special kind of sin. Blasphemy is something that comes from the heart. It's words that come out against God. John MacArthur explains blasphemy this way. He says, blasphemy represents conscious denouncing and rejection of God. Blasphemy is defiant irreverence. It is intentionally and openly speaking evil against God and about a holy God or defaming or mocking Him. That's blasphemy. And Jesus says, any blasphemy shall be forgiven people. Of course, the conditions have to be met. The condition of confession and repentance. The, con the condition of receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if the condition is met, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. This is an incredible offer. This is an incredible promise of the glorious gospel. Jesus anticipating that he would go to the cross and pay for our sins and to pay for our blasphemies. He's saying you can blaspheme God the Father and be forgiven. And you can blaspheme God the Son, Jesus Christ, and be forgiven. What an incredible thing this is. He even, he even says it again in verse 32. Whoever speaks a word, that's blasphemy, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. You see it there in verse 32? You can use Jesus' name as a curse word and it can be forgiven. You can mock him and you can mock Christians and that can be forgiven. And you can be like Paul 
who did not understand who Jesus was and it can be forgiven. He said, I did it in ignorance. Why can this be forgiven? Why can blasphemy against the Son of Man be forgiven? Well, partly because it's understandable to misinterpret who Jesus was. Right? He seemed only human at times. It took the twelve a long time to figure out who he was. Right? Think about it. He ate. He slept. He got weary. He sweat. He smelled. He had to go to the bathroom like the rest of us. It would be very easy to live with Jesus and say he's just a man. He's nothing but a man. He's a mere human being. And so God is very patient with this. God is very sympathetic with this, that we could speak a word against the Son of Man, that we could not recognize His full deity, that this is God in human flesh, and it shall be forgiven Him. Now, don't test this, please. But you can be wrong your entire life about Jesus Christ, and on your deathbed, change your mind and repent and be forgiven and go to heaven. This is the glorious gospel. It's not your works. It's God's grace. And Jesus here, the humble Jesus, the mild and merciful Jesus, said, you can say anything against me and I will, I will forgive you. You see, the unpardonable sin is something else entirely. Whoever speaks against, whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. This is the unpardonable sin. What is? Verse 24 is. See, verse 32 is equal to verse 24. Verse 24 is verse 32 in action. The unpardonable sin is seeing a miracle of the incarnate Jesus Christ with your own eyes seeing the miracle, not denying the miracle, and then saying he did that by the power of Satan. In other words, strictly speaking, we cannot commit the unpardonable sin because the incarnate Jesus has to be present doing miracles. This was a unique sin for a unique era of human history. This was a sin these Pharisees just committed by ascribing Beelzebul as his source of power. This is not a sin. This technically and strictly speaking, this <clears throat> blaspheming the Holy Spirit in the manner in which it has been presented is not a sin that you can commit today. So if you've been thinking that you've committed the unpardonable sin, good news, you haven't. Because you haven't seen Jesus do a miracle before your very eyes. I'm talking Jesus in the flesh, the incarnate Christ when he was here at the first coming. But is there an application here for us today? Is there, that's the interpretation, that's the one and only interpretation, but is there an application for us today? There is, it's simple. Reject Jesus and you doom yourself to an eternity of unforgiveness. See, the unpardonable sin today is a full, final, and complete rejection of Jesus and to die in that state. The unpardonable sin today is perhaps what Hebrews 6 describes, this having understood, having known, having seen, having experienced, and then, and then rejecting it fully and completely, never to return again. See, the only sin ultimately that condemns you to hell is rejecting Jesus. And in that sense, it's the unpardonable sin. So if you choose sin and you choose personal autonomy instead of surrender to the king, if you choose this world instead of the next, heaven with God, if you choose yourself instead of loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, then by definition, you will be rejecting the vaccine of God's grace in Jesus Christ. And if you reject the vaccine of God's grace, you will embrace the absurd, miss the obvious, search in vain for a neutral position, and doom yourself to an eternity without God. Are those better results than trusting Jesus? Help me here. 
are those better consequences than dying to yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus for the rest of your life? Let's pray. Father, by your Spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Lord, for those who came in this morning rejecting Jesus, we pray that today would be their day of acceptance. Today would be their day of belief, of trust, of surrender. Lord, there's nothing more foolish, more absurd, more ludicrous and damning than turning our backs on the Son of God. Oh, God, have mercy today on the lost in this place. May they be found. May they be rescued. May they be like this poor man. May they be able to see and to speak praises to God and free from the devil. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.